Well, good morning. You've made it. You did two days of Chehi, two full days of Chehi. Give yourselves a little round of applause. You're making it. Good job. It's a lot of stuff going on. I think I'll take it later, Micah. All right. Hold on. Oh, the Sig Muffins. That is an important question. They would not be good today. So you all earned them yesterday. They are gone. No more Sig Muffins. But we got some skippity candy, and you're about to earn some right now. We're back to whatever is true. Yesterday, we talked about the Bible. Monday, we talked about Jesus rising from the dead. We're going to review those, but first, let's check out our pun of the day. I had to change it. I had to change it because it's such a good pun. It was used last night at dinner. Do you remember the pun from last night? Why did someone kill all their... I forgot who it was. Someone killed all their chickens because they kept saying... Bok, bok, bok. Yes. So that one's, that one's taken. All right. How about this one? What's a club's... A golf club's favorite kind of music? Ooh, thanks for raising your hand. What do you think? I st- you're, you're on the right track. Yes. Swing. Ah, yes. Well done. What's your name? Tabitha. Here you go. Let's give it a candy. Coming your way. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Give it to her in a second. All right, let's move on. Week outline. Let's just talk about this key focal transition point. Day one, Jesus' resurrection. This was our first major truth claim. It was the most ridiculous claim in all scripture. This guy rose from the dead. But we know it happened because the evidence says so. Two, the Bible's legit, bro. The other most ridiculous claim in all scripture. This book is written by God. And we know it to be true because it's the most reliable text and, and it claims to be written by God. That's a very, 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 very short reduction of what we talked about yesterday. The implications of these two truth claims start with what we're doing today. On one side of the spectrum, we're going to talk about what this means for us in relationship with other people in public, in front of others. What does it mean to live in light of Jesus rising from the dead and the Bible being true? when we're in front of others. On Thursday, we'll talk about living in private in our relationship with the Lord, practicing integrity and pursuing Him. And really, this, this sermon on stage should really be at the end because we need to start with our relationship with God. Amen? Right? We need to start there. So day four really should be today, but, but because of the order of things, you'll see why in a second it's important that we talk about this theme today before jumping into our private devotions. Day five, we're just going to be applying meditation, doing the same thing, practicing and practicing and practicing exactly what we learned on day four. So on day five, that's Friday, bring a pencil with you. You'll have a piece of paper and we're going to be doing some things together. A lot of you have already been doing that. Thank you. All right, review from the other day. Scientific method has, it must be proven using two different variables. They are Esther? Yes. Observable and repeatable. Everyone say it. Great. Next. The legal historical method uses three methods of proof. What are they, Micah? Yep. Let's say them with them. Ready? Oral testimony written testimony, and exhibits and artifacts. That's very good. Name one piece of evidence used to prove the authenticity of the resurrection. It actually happened. Yes, uh, red hair, right here. Say it again. Yeah, uh, not 5,000, but it was another big number. 500, same difference, right? Just take out a zero. That's absolutely right. What's your name? What's your name? Penelope. Penelope, nice job, cool. We've got 500 witnesses, over 500 witnesses. Uh, let's see. What's your name again? Nathaniel. Nathaniel. What else? The Gospels. the Gospels. How many Gospels do we have? Yep, so how many is that? Four. Yep, that's right. That's right. We have four Gospels and they all say the same thing. If you only had one book, it'd be a little more sketchy, but four of them all say the same thing. And there's one more piece of evidence that we talked about. Isaac, do you remember it? They're all real. You can go visit them today. Well, not today, because you're a Cheki, but you know what I mean. Here you go, Isaac. Oops. Oh, that was awful. Horrible. Get it later. Let's, let's read them together. 500 eyewitnesses. Transformation of the disciples. Oops. And the witness. 
the written Gospels. I forgot about this one. Who is about to answer that question? I forgot it. Oh, I forgot it. I should, I should like, take candy out of my inventory for that. Tisk, tisk, Mr. Caleb. Oops. All right. Let's keep rolling. What are the three tests of historicity for the Bible? For the Bible. There are three tests. One has to do with the timing of when it was written. Another one has to do with what's, if, if it's reliable. Another one is stuff outside. Ooh, who can do it? I hate choosing. I love y'all. I, can't, I wish I could choose you all. What's your name right here? Say again. Zoe, Zoe go. Bibliographical, internal, external. Let's see if she's right. Can you say it with her? Bibliographical, internal, external. Yeah, good. Cool. That's awesome. Let's see what these do. Oh, wait, I got to get you something. Come on at you. All right. Jesus fulfilled how many prophecies? Well, look, he fulfilled a lot, but we're talking major prophecies. Mm. Mark. 60. That's correct. Oops. Sorry. Everyone say 60 major prophecies. That's great. We got 60 of them. Cool. Each New Testament book was originally written only originally written only how many years after Jesus' death? Yes, white shirt right here. Yep. Only 50 years. Everyone say that. Only 50 years. Great. I love it. Cool. And then now we're talking about the earliest manuscripts, the ones that we can read now, the ones that people actually copied and made digital. How many of them do we have today? It's a big number. Yep. Oh, I forgot your name. NASA shirt. Calvin. 20,000 copies. Say that. 20,000 copies. Awesome. You're right. Let's pray as we get started. Thank you, Calvin. Let's pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight. O oh, Lord, our rock and our redeemer. We pray this in your son's name who defeated the grave. Amen. All right, let's read our theme verse together. Let's do it. Ready? Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. In other words, think about what's true and put it into practice. First two days of this week, we've been thinking about what's true. Jesus rose from the dead. The Bible is legit and reliable. Day three, it's time to put it into practice. Day four and five, we'll also be putting it into practice. Buckle up, we have a lot to do today. So we're talking about performance identity. How do we view ourselves in front of others in light of these two truths? I wanna make sure I don't wanna miss anything here. All right, so I'm curious. Do you like me, this is a serious conversation, do you like me struggle with, you don't have to raise your hand if you do this, but do you, do you struggle with comparing yourself with others? Just answer the question in your head. You don't need to raise your hand. Do you struggle specifically with comparing yourself with others, especially with regards to your musical ability and performance? I have a tough time with that. I've always had a tough time with that. And I'm growing, and I've, I've learned to do a lot better in the way I handle it in my head. Um, but I still, I still fail mentally sometimes, and it's really frustrating. I get in this cycle where I, I just uh, I put myself down. Or, on the flip side, I put myself up and I put others down. It's one of those two. Maybe you can relate with this. Uh, I've been in a recital before where I'm I'm feeling really good about myself. I'm, I'm, I'm on this end of the spectrum. I'm, I'm on the prideful end. Let's see, pride. We got the belittling others end of the spectrum. Where I'm feeling like, oh, I'm really, really good at piano. That's my main instrument. Love it. And I, I can say I'm good at piano, but oh, as soon as I say that, my brain thinks, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm really good at piano. And everybody needs to know it. And yeah, that's all I have to say about that. It's really great. When I'm sitting in the recital, I'm thinking, all right, that person was okay, but I'm, on, I'm the last on the program for a reason. Um, oh, that person was all right. They messed up. They're kind of nervous. I'm not that nervous. I'm doing really good. 
Then I go up there and show everybody off. I'm like, yeah, best one here. That's, that's the horrible thing that's going through my mind. Isn't it sick? Like, I hate that I'm having to confess this to you right now. I don't want to be thinking that. I want to be encouraging the people there, but instead, my brain is going to putting other people down because I think I'm better than them. Like, who cares? What if we just all loved playing music and we just played music together? <laughs> That'd be so much better. But instead, of, I'm resorting to this end of the spectrum. I have also, at times, dealt with this end of the spectrum where I put myself down. I think, oh, man, that person's so good. There's a reason I'm not at the end of the program. I'm not that good. I try really hard, and I'm frustrated when I practice. I don't like practicing, because practicing reminds me that performance is right around the corner, and I hate performing, because when I perform for people, everyone's judging me. I know it. They all think I'm terrible. All these thoughts, and it, it's just awful. It's overwhelming, this sickening cycle. And I sometimes feel like I can't escape it. I wonder if you can relate with either side. They are both revelations of pride. On this side, the self-deprecation side, what do you really want? <laughs> if you were really satisfied in this horizontal plane, you would want to be the best one. If you think I'm the worst, what are you really wanting? Well, you want to be the best so you can feel good about yourself. Well, we all want to be the best. That's, that can be an innocent desire, right? We can want to be really good at something. That's fair. But it can turn south really fast. To think I'm really horrible leads us in the direction of I, I can only be satisfied. I can only be satisfied if I'm the best. If you think you're the best, you might consider others or you, you might also be buying into the same lie. You're thinking, I can only be satisfied when I'm the best. Just you wait until you meet someone who's better than you. It's going to rock your world. There's lots of people out there much better than you. There's a whole spectrum of ability. You know it. This is just one pool here at Chehi. To, to keep yourself on this horizontal plane is exhausting. It's going to rip you apart no matter which part of the spectrum you're on. And it's not going to satisfy you. To find your, your true satisfaction and your ability to perform it's going to let you down because you're not always perfect. And I'm not always perfect. So, what's the alternative? Well, instead of this horizontal plane, we have the vertical plane. Can you show me a horizontal plane right now? This is what we were just talking about. We had this end. You're pointing this way right now. This was the self-deprecation, right? Other side. This is the belittling others. It's all pride. Now show me this. Vertical plane between us and God. We're all here, we're all here, but in relationship to God, we are all sinners. Thanks, we can put your hands down. We are all sinners. Our ability to perform is a gift from God, and we all have varying abilities there, and we can praise Him for those gifts, but when we realize that we are all in need of grace on the cosmic scale, nothing else matters nearly as much as that, that we are sinners purchased by Jesus' death burial, and resurrection for God's glory to serve him for the rest of our lives. This is the spectrum we must maintain. But this is where I get frustrated. <laughs> Oftentimes in a sermon, I'll be like, yeah, amen, preacher. You're right. Keep your perspective fo focused on God. Just do it. I have yet to give you any tools on how to do that right now. So if I finish right now, I would be doing you an injustice, a disservice. I want to help you. Let's move to some practical application. All right? Oh, wait, before I continue, drink of water. Must hydrate. Who's drinking one cup of water at every, every meal? Yes, amen. If you're not raising your hand, you should be. Put your hand down. But I won't judge you on how you perform, so it's okay. <laughs> All right, so we have two verses. Uh, this is from the book of Amos, a very small book what I'd say in a, a minor prophet or an insignificant prophet in the Old Testament. He's addressing the book, I'm sorry, the people of Israel. They, you know Israel, they don't mess around with their sin. They're always sinning, falling away from the Lord. And here's what he says. I, God, hate all your show. Take away from me the noise of your songs, the melody of your hearts. I will not listen to them. But instead... Notice the replacement here. We have problem. You can't just stop the problem. You have to replace it. 
Instead, let there be a flood of justice and an endless pursuit of righteous living. That's an Old Testament thing. Love Old Testament. Let's talk about New Testament. Paul says the same sort of thing. We're going to hit hard on this today. From Philippians. He says, here's the problem. He's stating it in red. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Selfishness is another very close ally of pride. They work right hand in hand. It's a self-focused, self-absorbed mentality. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, notice the replacement he's suggesting. Rather, instead of this, in humility, value others above yourself. Practical application, Paul. Thank you. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Oh, we're almost there. Paul's suggesting that we keep our, our minds off ourselves and focus on others. That's great, but we still haven't gotten practical enough, I think. I want to give us some ideas of like how, we can, how we can live this out. All right? Again, let's make sure I'm not skipping anything because it's all so important. Mm, 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 mm. Okay. Yes. Perfect. Okay. So Paul's... Yes. Right. Sorry. I, I, I'm back in. Forgive me for my awful transition. Tisk tisk, Mr. Caleb. All right, Paul's statement right here. He's writing the Philippian church. It makes it sound like the Philippians did something wrong. But if you know the book of Philippians, uh, the Philippians were actually a pretty solid church. Paul loved them. He didn't really have any beef with them. He thought they did a really good job following after the Lord. And you can see that from the following two texts. I have two campers who have asked to read these. The first camper, can't remember their name, I'm so sorry. But would you please read that for me? Where are you? Go ahead. Thank you very much. What's your name? Egon. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, notice he doesn't really have any problem with him right here. Let's check out the next verse. This is in the beginning of the book. Go ahead. Right, and the, the sentence continues on, but his point is, you've always obeyed the Lord. I always thank God for you. I have no problems with what you're doing. You're doing a really great job. Now, maybe, <laughs> I wonder, for the past 10 minutes, if some of you were like, Caleb, this is a good sermon for somebody else, but I'm really doing fine. I don't feel like I struggle too much with this, this, uh, this comparison game. I have in the past, but I'm doing well now. Um, guess what? <laughs> we're all prone to wander. We are so prone to wander, and we just fall back into sin, kind of like the Israelites. Kind of like the Israelites, right? So we need this reminder, even if we're feeling okay about our mental game right now in this moment, let's remember what Paul just said a minute ago. Do nothing out of selfish ambition. Instead, value others above yourselves. Okay? So for those who are feeling great, still apl applicable for you. For those who are struggling with this, let's talk about how to fix this. All right? All right, here's the big chunk right after what we just read. Paul uses Jesus as the ultimate example of selflessness and humility. And I want us to read this together. All right, can you please read out loud with me? Let's do it. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Freeze. In other words, Jesus is God, and he didn't consider that massive level of ability something to look down on others for. Of all the people in the world, Jesus has the right to say, you are trash. You are awful, and I'm so much better than you. You'll never measure up to me. I'm going to distance myself from you, just condemn you to being terrible, and I'm better. He, he could be on that end of the spectrum. On the, the belittling, you are awful. In fact, that's really all that... I want to be careful here. God is holy. There's a problem here. God is holy. We are sinners. We cannot interact with God in any other way unless someone can bring us 
to God by Jesus, his son, right? God has to view us as sinners. We cannot come into his presence unless there is a savior who can change that pattern, right? So <laughs> let's take a look at what God has done for us. Let's take up, let's look at the next half of the section. Read it with me. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Yo, Jesus is up here. We are so low compared to him. He is holy. We are imperfect. Remember that vertical spectrum? Can you show me that again? He's, he's here. We're down here. We have no chance of measuring up to his standard. Excellent. Hands down. But in order to bring us to him and have a relationship with him, he humbled himself. The most extreme contrast ends of the spectrum. Holy God becomes sinful man. He did not sin, but he took on our sin for our sake. He took on all of our sin. He went from totally perfect to being filled with total sin, utter sin, and he died for our sake that we could come to know him and have that, that relationship with him. And if we all believe in that, we have that common playing field in relationship to our performance identity. We all know we are saved by the Lord and our ability to perform music is a gift from him. It's a beautiful thing and we are all thankful at the same time with our eyes on Jesus, not on each other, to how to compare ourselves and to find our identity. Our identity is found in our Lord. So remember our verse from earlier? Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me, put it into practice. Who's the me? Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me. Who's me? This is written to the Philippian church from who? Paul. So Paul is actually, in this case, he's saying whatever you've learned or received from me, put it into practice. Some people have a problem with that. They're like, wait, Paul, you're, you're not Jesus. But you know what he did? He did a great job mirroring Jesus' character. And you know what he also just said? We just read it. He said, whatever you've learned or received from me. He just said all this stuff about Jesus representing the perfect humility, perfect example of humility. We just learned that. Let's put it into practice. Finally, the most applicable, practical part right here. Let's get to it. Application. Instead of tearing yourself down or instead of tearing someone else down, what if you encouraged yourself and encouraged others? More importantly, encouraging others will actually be an encouragement to yourself. For example, consider this. So you make sure I'm in the right spot. So sorry. Yes. All right. So someone, someone's practicing and you're in the hallway, and you're having this hard mental game in the music building, thinking, oh, they're really good. I have to go practice. I don't want to go practice. That's awful. That person's so much better than me. You're on the belittling end of the spectrum. If you get your mind, mindset off of yourself and go listen to them just for a moment and think, wow, they did one thing or two things really well. I'm going to lock that away. When they're finished, at some point at dinner or at sing time, I'm going to go find them and say, well done with this specific thing. I was listening to you practice. Not to be creepy. Just to, just to listen, and you did a really nice job. Or if they per are performing in public in front of others, think, latch on to one thing that you thought they did well. Guess what that's doing? It's getting the head game out of your own head onto them, thinking, how can I bless them? Consider not your interests, but their interests as more important in this situation, right? Not only are we to encourage, but we are to pray in these situations. I really should have listed that first. When you're having a tough time with this head game, bring it to the Lord. Surrender it to him. Say, Lord, I'm having a hard time right now. Please help me with this. But don't just sit there. Do something about it. Actively go encourage someone. Lastly, memorize and meditate on Scripture. Y'all, there's a reason why God's Word changes people's lives. Remember yesterday we talked about testimonies as one of the reasons for proof that the Bible is written by God. God, if you memorize his word and hide it away in your heart, it will change you. 
It's not just empty words. These are God's words to you to transform your heart. And if we set it, to set it in our minds to memorize and apply, when we get into these situations where we're having this tough mental space, the scriptures come back. We recite it. We pray through them, which we're going to do in a minute. And we seek to encourage others. And that's the recipe for godliness and sanctification and leaning on the Lord and trusting him. Let's see our first scripture that pertains to this. Scripture number one. I have a counselor reading this for us. You can read it. Whatever you do, work heartily, as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as a reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. Excellent. As we read through these scriptures, I'm just going to pray through them, eyes open, with you. Let's pray them, pray them as a corporate prayer. Just, you're not going to say anything. Just pray these words with me. Lord, in light of this scripture... Please help me to work for you, not for men. Next. Second scripture. Who's got that? Thank you. Go ahead. Right. Lord, in light of this text, keep me from the desire to please man. Help me to please you instead. Three. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of light. Thank you. Lord, thank you so much for giving me the ability to play music. It's such a great gift. Remember, help me to remember that it's from you and it's not something that I made up on my own. Four. Lord, thank you so much for giving me the ability to play and sing music. Everything you give me, whether hard, easy, beautiful, ugly, is from you. Help me to remember that it's from you. Five. Lord, thank you for giving me the ability to sing and play music. My musical talent is not my own. It's something that you have given me. You've even given me the drive to practice. Thank you for that. Six. Lord, thank you for giving me the ability. Everything I have, everything I am, every thought that I'm having right now, even these very words are yours. Help me to remember that and keep a healthy vertical perspective to trust you and thank you always for the gifts you've given me. In a moment, we're going to pray right now. I'm going to leave time for you before you get out of here. Think about this right now. Make a game plan today. Who are you going to intentionally encourage? It doesn't have to be really super intentional like, hey, Caleb told me to tell you that you're really good, so you're really good. That's awkward. No, think about it. Listen to someone today, or if you know that they've been doing a great job so far this week, or if you know they're struggling, they've had a hard week, reach out to them and encourage them. Right now, in the next minute, make a game plan with God in prayer. Be praying, Lord, who do you want me to encourage? In light of these scriptures, I remember that all things are from you. Help me to encourage others today. And help me to specifically encourage that one person that I'm going to go talk to today. Let's pray for a minute in silence, and then I'll close this out. Close your eyes and pray with me. Dear Lord, please change our hearts. We cannot hope to change ourselves without working, without you working in us and through us. We can try even to go today and try to encourage someone and and our hearts can still remain hard. But we need your spirit to work in us 
to sanctify us, to give us a different heart. That we could view ourselves in the right way as children of God purchased by you. May we find our identity in you through constant practice of of reciting and memorizing and living according to your word and loving others as you loved us. You said greater love is no one than this, that one should lay down his life for his friends. Lord, you set that standard and you're going to help us meet it. Please enable us today to go encourage one another and find our identity in you. We pray this in your name. Amen. Thank you.